World News Tonight. Vaccine mandate. Get jabbed or go home as New York enforces a vaccine mandate for indoor events. Mass testing. COVID-19 returns to Wuhan after a year of no local cases. Strengthening ties. Ties in the ASEAN organization strengthens as unlikely allies cooperate. Skate off. New Yorkers take to the streets as a new method of relieving stress. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Danidu Vitanawasam. Good evening. Thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from a glimpse into the ongoing Olympic Games in Tokyo, Japan. The Tokyo Olympics carry on as the Olympic Committee continues to meet many hurdles along the way as COVID-19 cases continue to rise in the country along with the deterioration of multiple athletes' mental conditions. For more on this, we have other than a World News Special Correspondent Rasita Chandradasa from Tokyo in Japan. Rasita? Well, Dinidu, as we approach the third and the final week of the Olympics, China, the United States and rather surprisingly Japan are dominating the Olympic medal tables. As we know, this is a very unique Olympic happens during the, during the pandemic, where most of the athletes have to uh, follow the strict uh, COVID quarantine rules, and they have pretty much impacted their performance. It's not just the pandemic is impacting the athletes, it's also the scorching heat in Tokyo. As we all know, Japan, and especially the Tokyo, is well renowned for their hot summers. This year is very unique and some say this is one of the hottest recorded summer in Japan for many years. And some of the athletes actually have complaints about playing under this scorching heat. The world, uh, the world number one tennis player and Grand Slam champion Noak Djokovic, he complains that it's pretty impossible to play tennis in this heat and he actually wanted to move the games from daytime to night. No wonder he lost in the semi-finals and he was out of the middle contentions. And not just Noah Djokovic, many of uh, some of the athletes from Europe and the and US, especially, they were complaining about competing under this tremendous heat. And not surprisingly, the marathon event, one of the crown jewels of the athletics, have been moved to Sapporo, which is in the which is in the northern Hokkaido prefecture, far away from Tokyo, mainly due to this uh, heat and the humidity in Tokyo. We come back to the COVID impact on the athletes and obviously the world-class athletes, uh, all these quarantine rules, all these uh, PCR testings have clearly impacted their, their preparations. And one good example is the, the champion gymnastic and the reigning Olympic champion, Simone Biles. Uh, she actually withdrew from the, uh, some of the individual events as well as the, the overall the country-wise uh, gymnastic events. Uh, complaining uh, stress related issues. No wonder that the, the COVID rules, uh, strict quarantines and the uh, movements has impacted. But the good news is she actually won uh, a one final individual event where she competed, she won a, a bronze medal and where she declares that she wasn't even expected to compete in that event. So coming back to the medals table, China and US are dominating and the local boys and girls are also doing extremely well, uh, mainly due to their dominance in the judo. And this Olympic is also unique in a way that they have introduced some very interesting new games. As our viewers would know, we, 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 uh, we gave a coverage from the surfing area where our surfing was making a debut where the Brazilian champion surfer won the gold and a local boy won the silver medal. It's not just the surfing making Olympic debut, interestingly skateboarding is also making debut. All the young athletes like young as 12, 13, 14 are competing for the events. And the last week a Japanese 13 year old won a skateboarding Olympic gold and became the youngest Japanese medalist ever. So as we approach the closing ceremony, the closing ceremony was in, uh, on 8th, the medal tables, the gold medals and the other medals are expected to be dominated by China, uh, US and Japan. And when the finale comes on Sunday, the August 8th, we would be there 
giving a live coverage to our Derna viewers. Over to you, Dhanvi. Thank you. That was Adha Derna World News Special Correspondent Rasita Chandra Dasa reporting from Tokyo in Japan. Tokyo's hospitals have warned that the city's medical system is on the verge of collapsing unless more beds for COVID-19 patients are found quickly. According to the chairman of Tokyo Showa University Hospital, the situation in the Olympic host city is critical. A Tokyo hospital director has warned that the city's medical system is facing collapse if more beds for COVID-19 patients are not secured immediately. Hironori Sagara, the head of Tokyo's Showa University Hospital, says the situation in the Olympics host city is critical. If the number of COVID-19 patients rises further, we will have to impose restrictions on surgery or stop treatment for heart attacks and strokes in order to secure more beds. That is the stage we're in. The number of COVID-19 cases in Tokyo is rising. 3,709 new cases were recorded on Tuesday. Sagara has said that the number of beds that can accept COVID patients is now close to zero. We must avoid a situation in which the Olympics was held, but the medical system collapsed. Japanese authorities said on Monday that only seriously ill COVID-19 patients would now be hospitalised to try and ease the burden on healthcare services. This while others isolate at home. The announcement came as the state of emergency there was expanded beyond Tokyo. On Tuesday, the head of the Japan Medical Association called for the state of emergency to be extended nationwide. Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga and Olympic organizers say there is no link between the Summer Games and the recent increase in cases. But medical experts have said holding the sporting event sent a confusing message about the need to stay home, contributing to the rise. Over to India now, the closure of thousands of factories and a sluggish vaccination rate, especially amongst women, is expected to undermine their attempts to return to the workforce. Whatever social and economic gains Indian women had made in the last decade had largely been wiped out during the COVID-19 period. For more on this, let's cross over to other than a world news special correspondent, Gayatri Gunasekara, who joins us now from Delhi in India. Gayatri? Yes, Tanidu. The second wave of the coronavirus pandemic has pulled millions of people in India out of work with women bearing the burnt of the losses. The vast majority of employed women in India are in low-skilled work such as farm and factory labor and domestic health sectors that have been hit hard by the pandemic. Worse than anticipated slow economic recovery, the closure of thousands of factories and a sluggish vaccination rate, especially among women, is expected to undermine their attempts to return to the workforce. The second wave of the coronavirus pandemic is expected to deepen economic stress in India, which was already in its worst recession for seven decades. With the vast majority of Indians working in the informal sector, precise estimate of jobs losses are difficult. But in a country without a comprehensive welfare system or pandemic-related support for small businesses, several industry bodies have reported widespread redundancies over the past year. A report found that 47% of women workers who lost their job between March and December before the second wave of the virus hit in April were made permanently redundant. Back to you, Danidu. Thank you. That was Adha Derana World News Special Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekar reporting from Delhi in India. Now moving on to China, Wuhan, which gave the world its first glimpse of lockdowns and mass testings, had reported no local coronavirus cases since mid-May last year, until a few days ago when authorities confirmed three new cases of the Delta variant. China's Wuhan city will test all 12 million residents for the coronavirus. That's after the place where it emerged in late 2019 confirmed its first domestic cases of the highly transmissible Delta variant. Wuhan had reported no local coronavirus cases since May 2020, but on Monday, authorities confirmed three new cases of the Delta variant. The vice director of Hubei's Provincial Disease Control Center says these were linked to infections found in Huayan City in Jiangsu province. The outbreak in Jiangsu is believed to have begun in the provincial capital of Nanjing, with the Delta variant most likely introduced on a flight from Russia, according to officials. Since then, numerous cities in southern China and a few in the north, including Beijing, have reported infections. But it was not immediately clear if all of these cases were of the Delta variant or if they were all linked to Nanjing. 
as some authorities have not disclosed conclusive results of their virus tracing efforts. The Delta variant poses new risks for the world's second biggest economy as it spreads from the coast to inland cities. Authorities in numerous cities have launched mass testing to identify and isolate carriers. Over in the United States, New York City Mayor announced a mandate requiring proof of COVID-19 vaccination for people taking part in indoor activities in the city. Workers and customers of indoor restaurants, gyms and entertainment and performance venues will require patrons to show a vaccination card or city or state vaccination pass or they will be denied entry. This is going to be a requirement. In a first for the United States, New York City will start requiring proof of vaccination for some indoor activities, including indoor dining, gyms and entertainment, as the country enters a new phase of battling the highly contagious Delta variant. For New York Mayor Bill de Blasio, the announcement is the latest in a string of initiatives aimed at encouraging more residents to get vaccinated as the Delta variant spreads in the nation's most populous city, about 60% of all New Yorkers have received at least one dose. The program will be called, quote, the key to New York City pass. New York City's requirement of proof of at least one dose of the vaccine, which is set to go on a trial run beginning August 16th and go into full effect in September, follows on the heels of similar requirements in France. Eager to get New York City a key tourist attraction back up and running, private businesses were already starting to tell would-be customers, show proof of vaccination or stay home. High-end fitness center Equinox and its popular Soul Cycle centers announced Monday that it will require one-time proof of vaccination to enter its fitness clubs in New York City beginning in September. And the neon lights of Broadway are about to shine bright again, but ticket holders will have to have proof of vaccination to take a seat. As part of the plan, physical and digital versions of the vaccine card, as well as apps used by the city and state, will be accepted as proof. This is in stark contrast to other parts of the country, like Florida, where the Delta variant is spreading rapidly and Governor Ron DeSantis is refusing to impose any and all restrictions. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. We have some good news for you. Over the past two months, the United States has donated more than 110 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines to other countries. The White House says that's more than every other country combined, adding that it will deliver more in the coming weeks. According to the White House Tuesday, the U.S. has donated more than 110 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines to more than 60 countries over the past two months. Calling the donations a major milestone in the fight against the pandemic, the White House said it's a fulfillment of President Biden's promise and a significant down payment on hundreds of millions more doses that the U.S. will deliver in the coming weeks. In addition, the U.S. will ship 500 million doses of Pfizer's vaccine to 100 lower-income countries in late August. Of the 110 million doses Washington has donated, the majority were shared via COVAX, an international program aimed at assisting developing countries access COVID-19 vaccines. Part of them also went to South Korea this year, when over 1 million doses of Johnson & Johnson's vaccine were sent as a gift following the summit between Presidents Moon Jae-in and Biden in May. But Biden's gift to its Asian ally also came as he unveiled his administration's plans to distribute 25 million surplus doses across the globe, including 6 million shared among South Korea, Mexico, Canada and other partner nations, as well as UN frontline workers. The Biden administration has since upped its pledge to at least 80 million COVID-19 vaccine doses worldwide, with advocates saying the U.S. could share even more moving forward. The donation is all the more crucial in the global fight against the pandemic as countries are racing to inoculate their citizens with the rise of Delta variants globally. Last Thursday, President Biden said the U.S. was sharing doses to end the pandemic, which has killed over 3.7 million people worldwide, not to extract political power. South Korea held a ministerial meeting with the countries of ASEAN to discuss ways to reinforce their cooperation on the pandemic. This week, we'll see a series of multilateral meetings, including the ASEAN Regional Forum, which also involves North Korea. 
At a virtual meeting on Tuesday of the South Korea and ASEAN foreign ministers, Seoul's foreign minister pledged to deepen cooperation with Southeast Asian countries to overcome the COVID-19 pandemic and highlighted the need for strong global solidarity. Also discussed were the South Korea ASEAN summit slated for October, vaccine partnerships, economic recovery and issues related to Myanmar. Regarding the restoration last week of inter-Korean communication lines, ASEAN voiced support for engagement for dialogue with North Korea. On the same day, South Korea also took part in the ASEAN Plus 3 meeting involving China and Japan to discuss responses to COVID-19 and efforts toward an economic recovery. A series of virtual meetings are set to take place this week, including the East Asia Summit Foreign Ministers Meeting on Wednesday, which involves the U.S., China, Japan and Russia. The agenda there will include regional and global affairs as well as COVID-19 and climate change. On Friday, South Korea takes part in the ASEAN Regional Forum, or ARF, which involves North Korea, the U.S., China and Japan to discuss Korean Peninsula issues and other regional affairs. At last year's virtual ARF, North Korea's ambassador to Indonesia took part on behalf of the regime's foreign minister. It has yet to be announced who will be participating from the North this year, but there is speculation that the North Korean ambassador will join this year's forum too. However, a senior official at the U.S. State Department said Monday that they do expect it will be the North foreign minister, though Secretary Antony Blinken has no plans to engage with him. The State Department says North Korea will be on the agenda during meetings with ASEAN this week, along with the South China Sea and Myanmar issues. Iran's Supreme Leader presided over the endorsement ceremony of the country's soon-to-be new hardline president, Ibrahim Raisi. The ultra-conservative incomer vowed to end all U.S. sanctions on Iran. Ibrahim Raisi was formally endorsed by Tehran's Supreme Leader Tuesday to take office as the new president this week in accordance with Iran's constitution. During the ceremony, which comes amid heightened tensions between Iran and the West over the stalled 2015 nuclear deal and a recent attack on an oil tanker in the Gulf, Raisi vowed to take steps to lift sanctions imposed on Tehran by Washington, which is described as, quote, tyrannical. We will definitely pursue the removal of the oppressive sanctions, but we will not tie the people's dining tables and the economy to the foreigners' will. He also promised to improve the living conditions of Iranians, which have worsened since 2018, when the U.S. reimposed sanctions after withdrawing from the Obama-era nuclear deal. Raisi, who won the June election with over 60 percent of the vote, has been emphasizing a collective security system in the Middle East for peace and stability in the region. Ahead of his inauguration Thursday, the incoming president reportedly sent a reply to the election victory message sent by North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. According to Pyongyang's foreign ministry Tuesday, Raisi said he sincerely hopes to see continued development in their relationship across all sectors. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The Dominican Republic will slaughter tens of thousands of pigs after detecting outbreaks of African swine fever in 11 of the country's 32 provinces. Authorities said the only way to stop the disease for which there is no vaccine is to kill the entire pig population in farms. 41 people were killed in a road accident in south-central Mali when a truck carrying goods and market workers collided with a passenger bus. The crash happened 20 kilometers from a town called Sigo. Artisanal fishermen burned barricades on the streets of Chile to protest their exclusion in a financial package to ease the economic fallout of COVID-19. In Talcohuana and Coquimbo, protesters set tires alit in an effort to pressure authorities for economic relief. And finally tonight, roller skaters flock to New York City's Central Park on a hot summer afternoon to sweat out their stress, twirling, shimming and doing the splits as the DJ pumped out party tunes. The reason behind this was that the skaters needed the escape due to COVID-19 and racial unrest over the past year due to the killing of George Floyd by a police officer. Skaters in New York are rolling into Central Park hoping to sweat away the stress of a global pandemic. 
and a fight for justice that shook many of them to their core. Lene Davis, AKA Lene the Moving Star, is vice president of the Central Park Dance Association. Mr. Floyd got murdered and COVID-19 and all of the other things that came along with being inside for so long and wearing masks. You had to find a way to get that stress off. I put my skates on and I just had to roll through it all. The association suspended its official activities last summer, but Davis and others skated through the shutdown. Open since April, the skating rink is now bringing in an audience along with the performers. It's like musicians. You know how you can listen to a hundred different musicians and they have a hundred different sounds? Nobody sounds alike. Same thing with roller skating. Nobody skates alike. Some skaters said they were mindful of clouds on the horizon as the Delta variant spreads like wildfire through parts of the United States. But barring new COVID curbs, the association said they plan to keep the party going through September. That is all from us here at World News. Suzanne Shinali will be back tomorrow with a new edition. Until then, stay safe and protect your loved ones. I'm Danny Zanwasam. Have a great night.